Okay, hello students. This is going to be your final. It's your mock. And so make sure you speed build beforehand. Um, this is only your mocks. Okay, you're going to get two. So on the first one, this is going to be one minute at 180 for practice. Okay. Make sure you access speed building that you got into EV360. Um, something other than what's here because it's just your finals. And remember, everything is due um, Wednesday before midnight. So type up your dailies, everything, get it in Wednesday before midnight, okay? Here we go, 180 for one minute practice. Mr. Speaker, I am introducing today resolution to protect the life of the unborn. It is with a deep sense of moral responsibility and conviction that I once again propose this amendment to the Constitution of the United States to ensure that due process and equal protection are afforded to each and every individual with respect to the right of life. Mr. Speaker, more than 100,000 babies are aborted every year. Those abortions are in direct contradiction to the principle that each and every individual has the most basic of all rights, the right to life, it is the responsibility of the United States to protect that right. This responsibility has been recognized by many of my distinguished colleagues. I am pleased to say that liberals and conservatives alike, as well as individuals on both sides of the road, have repeatedly shown support for the God-given right, the right to life. It is deplorable that we find ourselves in a society where abortion is commonplace and where physicians and intellectuals condone the taking of lives. And so we have on your 180 lit, proper names, none. Okay, so no proper names. This is gonna be then 180 lit for your mock for five minutes. There are many different kinds of lies that people tell. And some of the most outrageous ones are from people trying to get out of jury duty. As an attorney, I've heard it all. All attorneys understand that there are a lot of people who are seriously inconvenienced by having to serve on a jury, and the justice system does what it can to accommodate those who simply can't afford to take time off work or those who have young children or elderly parents to take care of. The court also accommodates those who don't speak the language well enough and those who are mentally ill or hard of hearing. But that aside, there are also just as many people who like to get on a jury. There are plenty of people who want to get on a jury in order to influence the verdict. We call these sort of people stealth jurors, and it can sometimes be difficult to spot them and keep them off of a jury in the first place. How do we find these potential stealth jurors ahead of time? And how can we minimize the harm they do? In all honesty, we can't always weed them out, and there are plenty of times where they worm their way into the jury box. If you spend a little time reading the tons of research that has been done on the topic, you will slowly but surely come to understand that liars do look you in the eye when they talk to you, and they do not always shift in their seats when they are in the midst of telling a lie. They are expert at what they do, and they can fool even the most experienced lawyers, even those whose sole aim is to seek them out and uncover their lies. One of the techniques we attorneys use during jury selection is to ask the potential jurors a lot of questions. When talking to prospective jurors, as I have done so many times before, that is one of the smartest ways to get past any bias or prejudice that a juror might harbor. Questions can be a tool to get at a bias that is being concealed. A stealth juror will most likely already be aware of what the lawyer is attempting to do, no matter how the question is shaped or how many different ways it is asked. They often pride themselves on heading it off. What the very same juror might not realize, however, is that the stories that they tell from his or her past or what they tell you about the websites they like looking at are ways for an attorney to call out a bias or prejudice. Another way to get inside the head of a potential juror is to listen carefully to the way they speak. A juror with an agenda will often speak in a code that they have forgotten is a code of any kind. I have said before that it is easy to learn some of the language that extremists use when talking about things they like to do or things they don't like doing, and they may re 
reveal a bias without realizing they have done so. I also want to mention a juror who is very quiet. Attorneys rarely forget to ask a person why they are being quiet and will try to find out if they know something they aren't telling us. I once had a juror tell me that she was the fiance of the defendant. In the same way that we will try to prepare a jury to hold to their views and to deal with them in the jury room, we can also prepare them to respond to what might be someone who does not have the best interests of justice in mind. In the cases where we know for a fact that a juror has lied about a bias, it is usually because another juror reported it to us. Why are we so troubled then by jurors who lied to us? It isn't like any of us have never heard a lie or told a lie before. In fact, we all have heard lies so often that it rarely gets us angry anymore. We live in a culture of lies, a culture where lying has become acceptable. So why is it that jurors who lie keep attorneys awake at night? Maybe because it puts a lawyer at risk and that is something that we all take personally. It's like have a bug in the case or a hidden bomb sitting there ticking, waiting to explode. No matter what happens at a trial, how good or how bad the evidence turns out to be, this one stealth juror could sink the whole ship because that is their objective in the jury room. We feel compelled to prevent that from happening, obviously, and we'll do our best to weed them out with questions and by getting them to talk about themselves. What I want you to consider is that there is something else at work here too, and that is a deep belief that we all share with those other jurors who don't like to get on the jury. We want to truly believe that the courtroom is a place where justice transpires, and that is what it should be. We see that need, and then we have one minute, 200 jury charge practice. Mr. Foreman, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that is the law on which the indictments in this case are based. Now, with regard to the conspiracy charge, I charge you as follows. The word conspire is defined substantially as follows. If two or more persons agree acting upon a common purpose to commit a criminal act, they conspire. A conspiracy is a combination between two or more persons to do an unlawful act or to do a lawful act by criminal or unlawful means. There can be no conspiracy when one individual acts by and for himself only. In order to become a party to a conspiracy, a person must combine with some other person or someone else to effect the object of the conspiracy by means agreed upon. A mere mental purpose cannot justify a conviction of conspiracy. A common design is of the essence of the charge. Now, in order to establish Conspiracy, it is necessary first that the conspiracy or agreement to commit the offense alleged in the indictment be established, and second, to prove further that one or more of the parties engaging in the conspiracy have committed some act to effect its object. If the conspiracy is established, proof of the doing, and then you have your 200 jury charge, uh, Google, Internet, Capit, and Google Earth. This is going to be 200 jury charge for five minutes, you all. I would like to welcome all of you back from lunch. And we will resume where we left off once you are seated in your assigned seats, again in the jury box. Before lunch, I had begun reading the jury instructions to you, and I will now continue where I left off. The instructions that you will receive a copy of will be typed up in font that is easy to read. If you are anything like me, the older I get, the larger the print I require. You are to decide what the facts are. It is up to all of you and only you to decide what happened based on the evidence that has been presented to you in this trial. Do not allow prejudice, bias, or sympathy for one side or the other to influence your decision in any way. Bias includes but is not limited to a bias for or against a particular witness, bias for or against an attorney, bias for or against a defendant, or an alleged victim. Do not decide this case based on any implicit biases. As we discussed during jury selection, every one of us, whether we want to admit it or not, and whether we are aware of it or not, has feelings and fears and sometimes makes assumptions based on those things. 
That is what an implicit bias is, and we may not even be aware that we have them. These hidden thoughts can impact what we see and hear and how we recall what we see and hear. These hidden thoughts or implicit biases can also impact how we make decisions, both big ones and small ones, because you will be making very important decisions in this case. I urge you to evaluate the evidence as carefully as you can, and I urge you to resist jumping to conclusions that are based on your personal likes or dislikes, your gut feelings or your biases. The law demands that you return a verdict that is based only on the evidence and your evaluation of the evidence, a verdict that is based on your reason and common sense, and a verdict that is based on these instructions that the court gives you. Our system of justice counts on a jury to reach a verdict that is a fair decision based on the evidence in the case and not on biases. There is no room for bias in terms of a person's race, skin color, gender, religion, country of origin, age, or a person's economic status. None of those things should factor into why you reach the verdict you do. You must follow the law as I explain it to you, even if you disagree with it. If you feel that an attorney's comments on the law conflicts with my instructions to you, you are to follow my instructions. Pay careful attention to all of these instructions and consider them together. If I happen to repeat one of the instructions, do not think that I find it more important than any other of the instructions, just because I repeated it. Some words or phrases used during this trial have legal meanings that are different from their meanings in everyday use. These words and phrases will be defined further for you in these instructions. Please be sure to listen carefully and be sure to follow the definitions that I give you. Words and phrases not defined in these instructions are to be applied to their ordinary meaning. Some of these instructions may not apply depending on your findings about the facts of the case. After you have decided what the facts are, you are to follow the ones that do apply to the facts as you find them. Because the law requires that you decide the facts on the basis of what you hear and see in this courtroom only, in order to do that, there are some basic rules of common sense that you have to follow, especially in today's world where there are so many sources of information available to you. Please be sure that you follow these rules, which will help you to do your job of deciding the facts on the basis of what happens in this courtroom and keeping your minds tuned in to what goes on only in here. Don't do any kind of research about this case, either by yourself or as a group. This means that you are not allowed to use Google or any other search engine to look for information about the case or about the people involved in the case. That includes the lawyers and myself. The information that you get about the case in this courtroom will be the most reliable there is to help you to do your job. Don't use books of any kind or newspapers or the internet or any online resources to gather information about the issues in the case. Don't get other people to do that for you either. Don't ask your family members or friends or anyone else to do something for you that you are prohibited from doing yourself. As an example, and just to be sure that I am abundantly clear on this subject, you may not ask a friend or a child or a spouse or your partner to do research about this case and to tell you about the results of their research. Don't try to gain any special knowledge about the case other than what you hear and see in the courtroom. Don't accept help in deciding the case from any source outside of this courtroom. You and your fellow jurors have to do this work together and without outside help from the media. Don't use cell phones or laptops or anything of that sort in the courtroom or in the jury room during your deliberations. Don't use Google Earth to try to locate any of the places talked about in this case. Don't visit the scene of any event involved and we'll get ready for your Q&A. Okay, and this is gonna be one minute warm up at 225 y'all. Okay, one minute. Is it like this? No. Well, okay. Well, what direction was the pickup moving? Into our driveway. And the Bronco was moving right down Elm? Yes. 
do you have any estimate of distance between the front of the Bronco and the side of the pickup when you first saw the two vehicles? No, I couldn't say. Can you tell us whether or not the pickup was traveling in front of the Bronco going in the same direction that day, right before the accident happened, turning right into the driveway? Would you repeat that? Do you understand that question? No, not really. Do you think you could explain it to me? I'll rephrase it. Just from your own observations, do you know whether or not the pickup was traveling in front of the Bronco going the same direction on Elm and then it made a right into the driveway ahead of the Bronco? I don't know where the pickup came from. You answered that question. You don't know where the pickup was going that day. Is that right? Right. Yes. I do not know where it came from, sir. Did you see any turn signals on any vehicles? No, I don't believe I did. Did you have any more conversations with the driver of the Bronco other than what you've just told us? No, I think I have told you about all our conversations. And then we have on your 225 Q&A, um, words that come out, 1D, Levi's and Mill Road. This is gonna be 225 Q&A for five minutes for your mock and it does start in the middle. Is it that? I was going to say, who is in these? Okay. It starts in the middle, y'all. Sir, was this found to the right of the victim's head or to her left side? To the left of her foot. To the left of her foot. Do you mean away from her feet? Yes. Any jewelry on the victim or the deceased? Excuse me. As I recall, she had on a ring. And this picture, I think, shows that ring on her left hand ring finger and she also had a watch on her right wrist. There's a red object, correct, in 1D. What is that, do you know? It was some kind of an upper body garment, like a sweater or a sweatshirt. You found boots also nearby? Yes, sir. Where in relationship to the body that's depicted in 1D? You can see the boots there, black objects. It looks as though they are touching the photograph. It looks as though they are touching the victim's sole of her right foot. Both of them? Yes, they are both close together. Did you examine the boots? Did you personally? No, I didn't. Did you just pick them up and look at them? Frankly, I never touched the boots. I casually observed them at the location. Any time after that, did you look at them a little bit more in detail at some point later? I believe I looked at the soles for sole pattern and that was back in the lab. Would you notice what the sole, not the exact pattern, but anything about the soles that you can remember? Was there blood on them? Was there defecation on the bottom of the shoes or boots? I'm sorry, I just don't recall. Do you remember anything about the soles of the deceased feet when you found her? Yes, I believe one foot was dirty. The other sole was clean. By dirty, what do you mean? Defecation, mud? It appeared she had stood in the mud. It had been raining for several days in this entire area. It was really saturated with water and there was a lot of mud. There was a lot of water standing. It had rained after the victim had been killed. Did the boots have a heel on them? I believe they did, yes. Approximately how long? Three inches approximately. So your recollection is that one of her feet, the one foot, appeared to be dirty while the other was clean. It was not as dirty. Not dirty. Not dirty. Okay. Any evidence around the deceased body that appeared to you to be personal belongings, such as papers or cards? Was there anything like that that you noticed? First of all, do you understand the question? Yes, I do. No, the only personal belongings that were found, we believe were found, were the scissors that were used on the victim. On to a new area. You had an interview with my client that we saw on the video December 19th at nine o'clock in the evening. Is that true? Yes, sir. He tells you in that interview that I took my boots and I threw them away because I was afraid they were evidence. Do you remember that? Yes. Ultimately, he did tell us that. During the interview and so forth? Yes. During the interview, he told you where he put those boots. Is that true? He showed us, yes. He drew you a diagram? I think, yes. I think we had a diagram, and then ultimately, he actually went out in the field with us. He pointed out the location. Okay, that was my question to you. Did he bring you to an area and show you where he put his boots? Yes. Did it coincide with what he showed you on the diagram? As I recall, it was close, yes. During the interview, he told you he took the purse and disposed of it in a certain fashion. Is that true? That's true. He told you where in the interview? Yes. Took you where? He did. Did you find the purse? Yes. Basically the same location that he showed you during the interview? Yes. You said you found his underpants. Was that true? Yes. In the same location as the purse? That's correct. Is that package the same package? Overall, the same package, but I believe we had two bags within a third bag. Okay, there was fecal material on the underwear. Yes. Inside and outside, if you recall. As I recall, it was only on 
the one side and not both. It was in the front, but I don't recall if it was on the inside or if it was on the outside. You searched his home also? I didn't personally search his home. My agents did, yes. Did he tell you what he was wearing that night, pants-wise? During our interview, he told us several different stories. Ultimately, I believe he did tell us what he was wearing, yes. Several different stories about what he was wearing? Yes. Okay, but ultimately, he gave you a description of something that he was wearing. Yes. And at some point, that is after the interview, did you ever look at any evidence of a pair of pants that you suspected were his? I believe I did. I believe I went to the lab and looked at some clothing. Were there any fecal material on the pants that you suspected were his? No. Inside of the pants? No. What kind of pants did you look at? I believe it was Levi's. Levi's. I think it was a pair of Levi's. He tells you during the interview that the deceased went to an area where they had consensual sex. Is that true? That's what the defendant told us, yes. That's which number there, if you can remember? Number six. Right here? Yes, sir. And you went there? We did. That night? Yes, sir. Did he point out an area that he had allegedly had consensual sex? Yes, sir. Where was it? Can you describe it? The area that we are talking about is 105 Mill Road. He pointed out a location between the residents at 105 and 107 Mill Road. 107 is just north of 105. Could you describe the area, though, that is the physical area of, the, of where the sex allegedly took place? That's what I'm interested in, and I apologize for not making it clear. As I recall, at the time he pointed it out to us, I believe there were five-gallon black plastic rubber containers used to put plants in. I believe there were several on the ground in the location where he said they had sex. What kind of location did And we'll get ready for your second mock, okay? 